Welcome everybody to today's panel discussion. Uh, it's titled Plan and Vote for Kindness. Um, of course, election day in the US is uh, two weeks away, two weeks from today. And um, very happy to be um, on behalf of Kinexus, um, you know, playing the role of host for today's session. So I'm Mark Raven from Kinexus and my role here is really get things kicked off and then hand things over to my friend and partner and collaborator in this Deandra Wardell, um, who's gonna, um, going to be our main moderator and I'll jump in for some of the Q&A. So it's a, a team effort today and that team includes our amazing um, panel. And so we are joined um, today by, I'm just gonna do the quickest of introductions and, and Deandra and each of the panelists can add um, a little more about um, each, of, each of you and your backgrounds. But we're joined uh, by Karen Ross, among other things, she is the founder of the Love and Kindness Project and the Vote for Kindness Project. So thank you, Karen. This pin that I'm wearing is uh, from the Love and Kindness Foundation. So really happy to be wearing that today. We're also joined by Elizabeth Swan and Tracy O'Rourke. They are co-authors of a book called The Problem Solvers Toolkit. And they are co-founders, co-hosts of a podcast that I really like called the JIT Cafe, the Just in Time Cafe. We're joined also by Brunessa Drayton. She's a community advocate and political influencer. We're joined by um, Shelley Looper Wilson um, and uh, Jasmine McCoy of Alpha, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Deandra Wardell, let me turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Mark Graven. And thank you to everyone who's joining us today. And thank you to this amazing panel. I, I appreciate you saying yes when you received my request to join in on this panel discussion. And just to give everyone a little background as to what brought us here today, um, the intent and goal of today's webinar is we want to heighten awareness um, of the historical ties to current issues and challenges that we see today and, and different things that we see up and down our ballot that we'll be voting for that will have an impact on our lives, the lives of our families, the lives of those people in our community and of all Americans. And the other thing that is really important is that we the people, it's not just three words on a document. We the people is not something that's just on a t-shirt. There is power in we the people. And uh, that power comes from, for one, getting out to the polls and voting and raising our voices. And so uh, the other thing that's really important this year um, marks the 100th year celebration of the 19th Amendment. Um, and that is when most women um, have the right to vote. And so we're, we're going to talk about history. We're going to talk about, you know, what's going on with elections then and now. And each panelist who will be joining us uh, have different areas of expertise. They're gonna. They're. I'm just excited. I've been looking forward to this day for forever. And so again, we're just gonna get in and 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 get right to it. So, um, kind of the outline for today, and this is you know again lessons learned uh, from our last webinar is um, one of the things that the participants were interested in is what would be the topics that we are planning to discuss today? So I'll just run through those quickly and then we'll, we'll kick off with our first panelist. But we're gonna talk about, you know, what is this vote for kindness? What does that mean? And there's a vote for kindness project. There's resources that you can access. Um, as you see behind me, there is a sign that says vote for kindness. You too can have one of those. They're pretty cool. Um, also talk about ways to activate the vote. And so Elizabeth and Tracy are gonna talk about a voter activation postcard project that they've participated in. And then we're going to talk more about voting rights and the 19th Amendment and women's suffrage. And Shelley Looper Wilson will lead us in that discussion. And then, you know, it's important, like we said, everyone has a voice. And a, a, a voice that's really important is the voice of our youth. And so Jasmine uh, will speak on behalf of the youth and, and give some, some great pearls for us to ponder upon and things for us to do. And then Brunessa Drayton uh, will speak to voter suppression. That is not something in the history books. That is um, a present day concern. But 
like any obstacle, it's not something that we cannot overcome. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Karen Ross. Karen Ross is the founder of the Love and Kindness Project that also supports the Vote for Kindness Project. She is the founding mother of the Women in Lean, and I invite her to be a part of this panel because she is one of my coaches. And uh, while we're talking about the importance of raising our voices, she's constantly reminding me to raise my voice. So Karen, thank you for joining us today. And let's, let's learn more about this Vote for Kindness project. Thank you so much, Deandra and, and Mark and everyone else for uh, inviting me here. And it's a thank you for your introduction. I'm the founder and president of the Love and Kindness Project Foundation. And the Love and Kindness Project Foundation actually fosters projects that create kindness in the world. And something that some of you may not know about me is I am not actually uh, born in the United States. I'm an immigrant. And I came here from Canada about 30 years ago. And as a Canadian and as a permanent resident, I had almost all of the rights and privileges that United States citizens do. Except that actually there are two things that a permanent resident cannot do that some of you may not know. One of them is that I could not serve on a jury as a permanent resident. The other thing I couldn't do as a permanent resident was that I couldn't vote. And when it came time to make a decision to renew, renew my permanent resident status or make the choice to become the citizen, a citizen of the United States, I really had to think about it and the deciding factor for me in becoming an American citizen was that I really, really, really wanted the right to vote. As a person who was living here in the United States, I wanted to have a choice to raise my voice and add to, add to uh, the uh, collective that we all have in being able to vote. And so think about it, if you went to another country, it's actually a big choice to immigrate. And the thing that made me choose to become a United States citizen was that I was gonna have the right to vote. And since I became a citizen, I voted in every election. And last election and this election, as I began thinking about my foundation, I really thought, you know, one of the things I'm noticing is that there's a lot of unkindness going around in the way candidates are speaking. Bipartisan in all, in all the ways that we're getting information about the election. And I thought, I'm gonna actually make a decision in this election to vote for kindness. And I was going to think about, well, what does voting for kindness mean? Voting for kindness actually means that we're gonna choose leaders who are gonna make decisions for us as a country of how we can treat each other kindly. Voting for kindness means I'm going to pay attention to the issues that have to do with how we treat people kindly in this country, every single person. And I'm not only gonna research the candidates, what they say on all different kinds of platforms, I'm gonna research what they say and what they, how they say it about kindness because I want to live in a kind country. I want to live in a kind society. So the Love and Kindness Project Foundation created our Vote for Kindness campaign. As you can see, we have these yard signs. You can order one from our website. You can also print out a poster to download like Deandra has behind her. When you're thinking about how you are going to cast your vote this year, we're gonna ask you to please think about voting for kindness. Voting is kind, it gives everybody a voice and let's all actually vote for kindness this year. Karen, thank you for that. It's well said. And, and the website, there's a little bit of glare, but it's lovingkindnessproject.org for anybody who can't see that. Um, clearly, 
uh, on the sign so you can learn more um, about that. Um, so a question for you, Karen, um, do you have advice? What can we do if we meet somebody who is afraid to vote for one reason or another? You know, I think the thing is that from a point of view of kindness, if we meet someone who's afraid to vote, we can lend them our support. We can listen to their fears. We can help connect them actually with people who have information. We can go with them to a poll and stand right beside them. And I would encourage you for any of your friends that you have who uh, might be reluctant or any people that you find are reluctant, set up some time with them to chat with them, to talk about them, to understand their point of view, to listen to them. That's super kind. And then we can figure out what resources and what help they need if they're afraid to vote. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, Deandra, I think I'll turn it back to you for now. Yes. Okay, thank you, Mark. And thank you, Karen. And thank you for that, the important work that you and your foundation are doing with love and kindness and vote for kindness. Um, you're, you're certainly making an impact. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. So next, uh, Elizabeth and Tracy. Um, I am connected to Elizabeth and Tracy, again, through Women in Lean. And Elizabeth and Tracy are, are they're amazing. Um, if you have ever had any questions about anything related to Lean Six Sigma, these two people are the people that you should go to. They have um, you know, all kinds of information out there on YouTube and all kinds of training. And a few weeks ago, um, we were on a, just catching up, having lean girl talk, because that's what we talk about in our spare time. And they started chatting about um, the, the postcard voter activation campaign that they're working on. And I thought, how interesting. What are you guys doing on October 20th around 1 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time? And the rest is history. So uh, thank you for joining us. And without further ado, Elizabeth and Tracy, share with us about the great work you're doing in terms of encouraging people to get out to vote. Happy to do that, Deandra. And also, I just wanted to say, uh, listening to Karen, it reminded me that I, I dragged my husband to go vote early yesterday, which I've never done and, and we got there and there was a line. And he said, oh, there's, you know, there's a line. And we've never waited in a line, unlike a lot of people in this country. And uh, I said, I don't care. Let's get in the line. We've never done that. Let's just do that. So we, we got in the line. It was probably 20 minutes. I mean, there's people that vote, you know, 24 hours in a line. Um, and, uh, you know, we met some folks in line and had some interactions. And it was incredibly exciting. Um, I don't think I've ever been uh, quite so adamant about voting. So thank you, Karen, for reminding me just the, the right and the importance of it. And just coming back to Deandra, uh, you know, when she, a little history, when she instigated the root cause racism effort, I told her that I felt like I'd pretty much been on the sidelines and just thinking about why is that and I'm a white woman, and I hadn't actually ever said that or called myself that until I got involved in this project. It's like I gotta, I gotta own that in a, you know, a, in a predominantly white town, and I didn't know what my role was in terms of getting to the root causes of racism. So, inviting us uh, to blog, to be on a live panel on the topic, she pulled a lot of us off the sidelines and gave us a chance to get enrolled, to get involved, and have a voice and have a role. So uh, the exchange, the education, the energy, you know, spawned by that uh, continues to impact my life. And since I was off the sidelines, I had to say, well, what else can I do? You know, what was, what's my, how does my role evolve? And a young neighbor told me about a group called uh, Common Ground, and they had an effort called Reclaim Our Vote. And she said, you know, you can get postcards. She goes, I haven't done it, but my boyfriend's mother is doing. I was like, okay, I, I'm down to do that. So reached out, got someone local, got these postcards. Um, this is a nonprofit organization uh, seeking to ensure that eligible voters of color uh, are reinstated to voter rolls and that people in minority uh, communities have access to be able to vote. And 
uh, as a volunteer, I was given the postcards that Deandra talked about. Uh, I got addresses, I got information to give people. Some of that information was phone numbers to call to find out how to get reinstated. Uh, some of it was links to find out where there were early voting centers. Uh, so I took the scripts, got my little postcard stamps and, uh, and just kept signing up. And as in the process, got my mom involved. My 88 year old mother was like, yeah, I'm gonna come you know, write those with you. So we sat on my deck and, and did that at a little distance. And then I uh, got my young neighbor said, well, I, I can come help. And so got to know her better uh, and got the engagement around this was uh, kind of unexpected and interesting, getting to know my community better, which was uh, which was a wonder, wonderful thing. And I uh, also told my colleague Tracy about it. And she said, hmm, why don't you give me that link? And Tracy, what how did that work out for you? Yes, and just so you guys know, Elizabeth and I have been colleagues and friends for over 20 years. We talk regularly. We obviously have a lot that we do together. The Just In Time Cafe is one of those. And I am so happy to be a part of the Women in Lean group, a wonderful group of women, uh, people like you, Deandra and Karen and Elizabeth that inspire me uh, unexpectedly uh, in, in, in when I really need it. And, uh, and you do it daily. So thank you for that. I'm so happy to know you and happy to be here. But as Elizabeth said, I, I do did feel like a bystander too. Um, you know, I have two boys and I just caught out of, um, I guess this period of my life, I just finished elementary school, woohoo! So guess what? You have, you're doing a lot of volunteer stuff as a parent for, for, for elementary like children, uh, age children. And um, feeling like I really wanted to also be a part of something. I wanted to do something. I was feeling this uneasiness about standing on the sidelines too. I felt like a bystander. And so of course, it's funny how the universe works. So I'm talking to Elizabeth and she tells me about what she's doing and I jumped on it as well. Um, I wanted to be involved. And Elizabeth is on the East Coast, I'm on the West Coast. I called my nearest local representative to find out what I could do to get involved, get the supplies and the postcards. Uh, she told me there are various scripts that were being sent out to um, certain, certain states that had voter suppression. And some of them had been deregistered and didn't know it. And, and some of the scripts was about letting them know, hey, you better check that you're not deregistered. Um, and then the other one that we ended up writing, because I was too late for that, it was, you know, they had to send those out by a certain time, is just really encouraging current voters to get out there and vote. Uh, so uh, also mirroring Elizabeth, I called a few of my friends, including some of my mom friends, and asked them if they would like to participate in writing postcards and getting their kids involved uh, in writing in the postcards. What a great opportunity to share with kids about how important it is to vote. I honestly do not recall my parents voting when I was young. I don't remember, I don't have a recollection of them going, I'm going out to vote, I'll be back, watch your sister. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember any of that. Um, and so um, I think it's obviously important for them to show how important it is to vote. So I ordered enough supplies for all of them to write postcards. We ended up sending out about 400 postcards, which added to the 6.4 million postcards sent by Reclaim Our Vote just this year. Woohoo! So our challenge to you is make a plan to ensure your vote counts by checking the website IWillVote.com. It will list the voting options for your state and country. And if you have kids, talk about the importance of voting. Honestly, like I said, I don't have a recollection of that. Um, it's funny because when my, I'll just share a quick story. Uh, when my son was eight years old, he said, mom, what's a Democrat? <laughs> so I said, well, how do I explain this in a way that an eight-year-old can understand, right? So I said, well, so, you know, the president, there's two parties, there's two political parties. And so I said to him, so repeat back to me what you understood. And he goes, well, the president had a party, right? <laughs> I had to go back to the drawing board on that one. But anyway, so now he's 17, he gets it. <laughs> and he might be registering soon to be a poll worker, which we'll, we'll, we'll uh, let you know how to do that in just a moment. Back to you, Deandra, or Mark. 
I'm going to uh, jump in because uh, we've we've got a question. And if, uh, if attendees want to look in the chat, the IWillVote.com uh, website is there. So you've got that link to click on and um, you can confirm if you've registered the vote and find more information um, about that, how and where and when to vote. Um, but following up on the postcards, what can I do to get involved in writing postcards? How can I learn more about that? Um, so the postcards, I think, as we, as you pointed out, we've got two weeks to go that they, they are shifting gears, uh, and, uh, some of their efforts have switched to calling, uh, residents to get out the vote. Um, and just as a reminder, uh, the calls they made, they teamed up with black voters matter. Uh, they made 185,000 calls to Georgia voters. Uh, we've got a Georgia resident on, the, on our panel. Um, for the midterms, about 65% of those calls resulted in votes. So you can get involved with that. Um, and then, uh, as Tracy mentioned, Tracy, you just called about uh, helping with the polls, right? Yes. So there's an organization called PowerThePolls.org. There's a shortage of poll workers, largely because most poll workers in the, in the past have been elderly volunteers who are now at risk for COVID. So there's a huge demand uh, for poll workers. And guess what? Teenagers can volunteer to do this work. And guess what? It's 14 to 17 bucks an hour. Uh, so guess what? My, 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 my son is now uh, putting in his application. So we put his application in together earlier today. It's very quick and easy to submit the application and we really need to fill this gap. So if you have a teenager that needs something to do, <laughs> or if you would like to participate, go to powerthepolls.org. So those are just two options, Mark, if, if since postcards are on the way, one of them is to uh, reach out to Common Ground reclaim our vote and see who you can call or uh, go to the link that Tracy just mentioned to help with the manning the polls. That's a great suggestion. Okay, um, Deandra, back to you. Thank you. And Elizabeth and Tracy, thank you for those creative ideas. Um, I too had uh, the opportunity to take advantage of encouraging people to get out to vote. Um, as you all, I think you all may know this, but just in case you don't, I'm a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. And um, the chapter where I currently, uh, that I'm currently affiliated with, Alpha Mi Omega chapter in Indianapolis, Indiana, our connection person has done a great job in organizing the chapter and providing ways for us to encourage people to get out to vote. And so I was able to take advantage of um, a texting project where I could text 200 people in Indianapolis, Indiana, 200 registered voters and encourage them to request their absentee ballots and provide information about how to get out and early vote. And, and that was, you know, the best, you know, two to three hours of my life that I have spent and, and, and providing support and, and encouraging people to get involved and again, making sure that their voice is heard. And speaking of my sorority, uh, up next, I would like to introduce someone who I met, it's maybe been six or eight years ago. Uh, we both happened to be at a conference, um, a regional conference in the Southeast region. And Shelly Looper Wilson, I knew of her from a distance, but I had the opportunity to fellowship with her. And I felt like at the end of some of our conversations, I earned some extra credit or CEUs in history um, because she's just um, a walking encyclopedia. And um, encyclopedia, I'm dating myself. So she's a walking Google link, okay. But um, so she's a historian, she's a speaker, She's a com, um, an entrepreneur. She is a community advocate. And uh, like I said, she's my sorority sister. She currently serves as our international secretary. And um, I'm looking forward to, I've been, I've been looking forward to her speaking today and to talk about you know, the history of why the vote is so important for women. So I will be quiet and turn it over to Shelley Luper Wilson. Thank you so much, Deandra and Mark, the Chi Nexus family, and everyone joining us for this very important discussion today. I'm so honored to be a part of this uh, phenomenal panel that you have assembled. And I um, 
want to say, as I was listening to Tracy and Elizabeth, one of the things that stood out, well, there was something that that each of them said. And one of the points is Tracy was talking about remembering um, or trying to remember a parent's voting. And, you know, that's something I have a very fond memory of is going with my mother to the polls. And of course, at that time, the polls were those huge machines and they had those big curtains and you would pull the lever and it would hide you in that curtain. And, it, you know, and it just seems thinking about it now, it just really seems so antiquated. But so my youngest child is six and I took him with me to go vote last week and he saw the line and was a little concerned about that at first. And so we kept talking and then we got there. And so I was like, okay, you have to help me vote. And he was so excited and engaged. And when we left, he had his I voted sticker and he was like, voting was really fun. And so I'm so happy that that was his first impression of voting. You know, later on, we'll get into the importance of it. But the fact that he saw it as fun uh, really meant a lot to me. Um, and then Elizabeth raised some really good points that tie in perfectly to what I wanted to share br very briefly. And I'm going to try to speak as fast as my Oklahoma, Texas accent will allow me <laughs> so I can stay within this time frame. But as Elizabeth was talking about being pulled off the sidelines and being able to have a larger role and a voice, it just made me think of Deandra's reaching out and how that just ties into this long line of Black women's activism. You know, so much of it has been ignored, especially in the women's suffrage movement as we celebrate the passing of the 19th Amendment. So I just want to share very briefly uh, a, a few women that many may not have heard of. Of, but when I go back and read their words, it's incredible to me and also very saddening to me how relevant they still are, you know, in 2020. So when I think about the historical timeline I was asked to share, I, you know, come back to the quote uh, in Lovecraft Country that I have found myself quoting almost every day, when Ruby Betty said, I don't know what's more difficult, being colored or being a woman. Most days I'm happy to be both, but the world keeps interrupting and I am sick of being interrupted. So when I think about women's suffrage, I think about it's as essentially that request to live life without interruption, without interruption from barriers erected to prevent women, Black people, immigrants from access to a fair and equitable world, barriers designed not with love and kindness, but with divisiveness and hate and othering that elevates some while oppressing others. Racism played a huge role in women's suffrage, as we all know. So Black women had little cause for celebration 100 years ago with the passing of the 19th Amendment. But nevertheless, we've been persistent. So I just want to share just a few women. And the first, who's one of my favorites, is Maria Stewart. She gave a speech in 1832. And most people have never heard of Maria Stewart, even though she was the first known American woman to deliver a public speech and did it in front of a mixed audience, both black and white, men and women, which was not only unheard of, it was actually illegal <laughs> at the time. So in the speech, one of the things that she said, and this is in terms of coalition building, I, I think, she said, oh, yeah, fairer sisters whose hands are never soiled, whose nerves and muscles are never strained, go learn by experience. Had we had the opportunities that you had, what would have hindered our intellect from being bright and our manners from being as dignified as yours? And this is really what gets me. She went on to say, the things that are holding us back are prejudice, ignorance, and poverty. And how relevant is that today in 2020? And she said these words in 1832. And she ended that speech by saying, we need never to think that anybody is going to feel interested for us if we do not feel interested for ourselves, but we shall flourish. And I find that so powerful because she really was an advocate for using your own voice and intentionality and coalition building. <clears throat> 
when we talk about the 19th Amendment and the Women's Suffrage March in 1913, we can't not think about Alice Paul, right? Well, Nellie Quander was one of the Black women who for months had been working to request participation by the Black women students at Howard University. Uh, Alice Paul was succumbing to the pressure of others who felt like we can't conflate race and gender. It's going to have to be a one or the other. So Nellie Quander wrote many, many letters to Alice Paul. Of course, you know, at that time she couldn't send her a text or, you know, call her on the cell phone and say, hey, Alice girl, what's up? So she would send her these letters and, you know, they're on file at the Smithsonian. And they're really great because in one of them she said, because of your lack of response, I'm going to assume that maybe the letters hadn't reached you. So I'm going to say this one more time. We want the women of power to be able to participate in this march. And not only do we want to participate, we want to participate with all of the college students. We don't want to be relegated to the back. So there she was advocating for one cause. We have to elevate both. We're not going to go into this looking for rights for some at the oppression of others. Now, the next one I want to share with you is Charlotte. Charlotte Rollins. And so when we think about South Carolina, typically we don't think about women's suffrage, right? Well, in 1869, Charlotte Rollins spoke on the floor of the South Carolina House of Representatives. And one of the things that she said was we ask suffrage not as a favor, not as a privilege, but as a right based on the ground that we are human beings and as such entitled to all human rights. We claim that public opinion has had a tendency to limit women's fears to too small a circle. So I'm like, I'm feeling Charlotte Rollins in 1869. She was not about being placed within a circle. She was claiming her place, not as a woman, not as a black person, but as a member of the human race, which is so powerful and visionary. Again, this is 1869, just a few years after the Emancipation Proclamation. And then you know, from coalition building to petitioning government. The next point I want to make is just the complexities, especially of Black womanhood in this quest for women's suffrage and voting rights. And one of my favorites, um, Ida B. Wells, you know, she too was asked to march in the back in 1913. And she refused. She joined her fellows from Illinois, like, I'm going to be up here with my people. This is where I belong. I'm not going to let you place me in the back. And Ida B. Wells, so many accomplishments, so many feats. But the thing I think that sometimes gets lost, especially as we talk about Black girl magic and this, you know, superhero of Black women, is that these are women. These are people, too. And one of the things that Ida B. Wells said was I honestly believe I am the only woman in the United States who ever traveled throughout the country with a nursing baby to make political speeches. So here she was a mother traveling around the country with a baby that she was still nursing as she advocated for the rights for women and people of color. Mm. Now, finally, my favorite, Anna Julia Cooper, uh, she published a book of Voice from the South in 1892. And she too, the woman questioned the race problem. She talks about traveling on a train station in the South. And when she got out, she needed to use the restroom. And there was one that said for ladies and one that said for color. And so she had to stop and ask, which one is for me? Under which head do I come was actually her quote. So when you think about the complexities, as we talk about women's rights, we have got to make sure that we move forward, understanding that we can't be one issue or one cause oriented. We will never unroot racism if we're only focusing on one thing because that tends to happen at the expense of something else. So when we think about 1920 and when the amendment passed, then what happened the next year? Tulsa massacre, Black Wall Street, you know, not just there, but all across the country. So while white women were able to enjoy their newfound freedoms, Black women could not continue to focus on suffrage rights because they had to focus on survival. So as I was thinking about continuous improvement and what does that mean? You know, we have to get past the scarcity mentality that liberty is in short supply and there's not enough for everyone. Feeling that there always has to be somebody that you have to fight in order to be 
victorious. You know, we can't imagine and envision another way, a better way. We can find a way to continuously improve ourselves, our communities, our nation, and not do so at someone else's expense. We can work collectively and collaboratively collaboratively and not just focusing on one issue or one cause. So I wanna end by saying my philosophical approach to freedom and the way I see best to address root cause racism is rooted in the ideals of the black women who came together at the Kambahi River, the same river that Harriet Tubman led as a military commander. And in a black feminist statement written by those women, they articulated a pathway to freedom, a pathway to liberation, a pathway where everyone could thrive free of interruption, a pathway that offers real transformational power. And one of my favorite quotes says, we're actively committed to struggling against racial, sexual, heterosexual, and class oppression, and see as our particular task, the development of integrated analysis and practice based upon the fact that major systems of oppression are interlocking. Root cause racism systems and structures des are designed to protect the powerful at the expense of the majority. So how do we uproot this? We do it by exercising kindness as a verb. We vote and we vote in people that are aligned with philosophies rooted in humanity. And we hold them accountable by using all of our power to unmake and then remake systems grounded in equity and love. Yeah. <laughs> yeah there's Shelley, yes, there's um, a big round of applause. Um, thank you, Shelley. And you know, I do want to ask one question. You know, Deandra had shared with me information about your mother, Clara Looper. And um, you know, as a civil rights activist and reading about you know 1958, you know, I, I know the history, but my gosh, that was 15 years before I was born. And it's 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 disheartening to think that um, not that long ago that there were whites only lunch counters and and thankfully she was one of the activists um, to help stand up to that and she, and she later ran for the U.S. Senate and it sounds like she was an ama uh, an amazing woman. So um, are there any other stories that is there a story you would want to share about what you've learned from her? Oh my gosh, uh, there are so many stories, so many stories. And you know, um, I have an older brother and sister, so I'm 25 years younger than them. So their experience with my mother was much different um, than mine. But um, as we're talking about voting and voting for kindness, you know, she ran for the US Senate from the state of Oklahoma, you know, the only woman and the only uh, non white candidate. So when you look at the photo of that election year, it's just really Really amazing to see her on there again in 1972, Oklahoma. And one of the things that she wrote about in her book was just how that experience really changed her. As she traveled across the state, it made her realize that people are people. And if she could help get more people to just see us as people, um, rather than trying to divide and categorize us, you know, how much better uh, we would be. She talks about um, being introduced in Henrietta, uh, which was the town that wasn't just to sundown town. I mean, they had a sign uh, that said Negroes read and run. If you can't read, run anyway. And that wasn't just at night. You know, that was the town closest to where she grew up. So she couldn't go and try on shoes. They would have to trace their feet on a paper sack and bring that tracing to the department store in order to buy shoes. So to be introduced there as one of us, you know, she was able to see a real change that her parents would have never Ever imagine. And one of the things, if I could just share really quickly, because she had a lot of questions about, you know, can you represent us because you're Black? You know, can you represent us because you're a woman? And uh, one of her responses to a question uh, was about, how do you feel about intermarriage or marriage between the races? You know, what are your thoughts about that? And this is a direct quote from her. And she said, 
Of course, I feel good and I believe in marriage. In my travels, I've never seen an ant and an elephant having intercourse. And that tells me that anything that God did not want to integrate, he made it biologically impossible to do so. And I do not want anyone else to ask me about intermarriage because if you do, I'm going to assume that you are inferior and not able to compete in a market where something else is important beside the color of skin because the real action takes place in a place that's completely sealed off from the public. In other words, I'm saying it's not the color, it's the thrill. So, <laughs> you know, when I read that, it was it, it was very funny. So, um, but of course she lost the election 1972. You know, Oklahoma didn't have a woman senator until Mary Fallon, maybe, um, you know, not too long ago. So, uh, but still that fact that she was able to put herself out there uh, because she believed that she could be a vehicle to affect change. And even though she wasn't victorious in that, elect, in that election, uh, just being able to reach out to so many diverse people, uh, I believe actually changed more than what she realized. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, Deandra, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Okay. So uh, we, we have an expression um, in, in our church um, that says, did our hearts not burn? And Shelley, as you spoke uh, to the other panelists and those who are joining us, did our hearts not burn? I was over here cheering and saying, say it, Shelley. But out of all of the great points you shared and, and the history, um, you know, something you said, we have a place and we have a voice and we have a vote. And, and that is true for our youth. And so it gr brings me great joy to introduce another one of my sorority sisters, Jasmine E. McCoy, who's a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, I have to say it like that. Uh, she's currently a senior at Harvard University. Uh, she is a pre-med major with a minor in molecular and cellular biology and will be an orthopedic surgeon, uh, which is so important because part of what we talk about in the Root Cause Racism series is in healthcare, how there needs to be more representation. We need to see more black people and people of color um, so Jasmine, kudos to you. Um, and I'm, you know, I've, I've watched you since you were a young girl. I'm extremely proud of the work you're doing. And she's currently serving as our second, our international second vice president, where she is mobilizing youth all over the country to get involved with this election. So without further ado, Ms. Jasmine E. McCoy, I turn it over to you. Thank you very much. And hello, everyone. My name is Jasmine McCoy. I am the International Second Vice President of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. And I am so excited and honored to be speaking about the importance of young voter participation and mobilization. Again, I'm a senior at Harvard University on the pre-med track concentrating in molecular and cellular biology with a secondary in African-American studies and a citation in Spanish. This very morning, not even two hours ago, I cast my first vote. My mom and I dressed in our AKA's vote sweatshirts, drove to the Board of Elections and turned in our absentee ballots. I missed the last election by three months, so I was not about to let anything keep me from performing my civic duty. First time voters, the young adults ranging from 18 years old to 21 years old like myself. This is our time to shine, to mobilize our forces and flood the polls. It was the 26th Amendment passed in 1971 that dropped the minimum voting age from 21 to 18 years old. This is a right that was literally fought for by soldiers in the Vietnam War. They said, if they were going to be drafted, then they should at least have the opportunity to participate in the government that dictates their future. And I want young voters to remember that word, future. The future, your future, my future, our future. As a young adult, the future is a large and abstract thing to try and comprehend. For many of us, it includes graduating college, moving out of our parents' house, finding a job, and possibly starting a family of your own. We've obviously given our futures some thought. It should make sense then that an educated, routine voter factors into the mix. 
If you care about having a clean and healthy planet to live out your future, you'll vote. If you want to have a growing economy with the opportunity to get a job after graduation, you'll vote. If you care about reproductive rights and having affordable health care, you'll vote. If you care about the safety of Americans and have opinions about our military, you'll vote. If you care about your future, you will vote. To not vote says that you are content with 140 million other people making those decisions for you. Voting almost reminds me of a group project. Regardless of the vote that you make, everyone should participate. I'm not telling you who to vote for, I'm just telling you to vote. You don't want to be that one member of the group who does nothing, has nothing to say, and then after the, the presentation is done, then you have something to say. That means you don't want to be an el eligible voter, not vote, and then have something to say after the election. You won't be able to celebrate if your candidate won because you didn't do anything to help them. You won't be able to complain if your candidate lost because again, you didn't do anything to help them. Your vote is your voice. And if you don't cast it, you're silencing yourself. First time voters, young adults, millennials, we need to use our voices to bring in a new wave of opinions to the 2020 election. If you're a first time voter or know someone who is a first time voter, ask them if they have a voting plan. And this plan has to be more than I'm going to vote. Do they actually have steps for how they're going to achieve that goal? If not, you can help them along by including them in your plan. For example, you can carpool to the Board of Elections, or you can carpool to your nearest polling place on November 3rd. Whatever you do, make sure that first time voter is feeling included and that this is their country and that they have a voice in deciding the future of that country. Whatever you do, vote for a future that is filled with kindness. Jasmine, thank you so much for that. Um, are there particular steps? You know, you talk uh, about the power of casting an informed vote. Um, are there specific recommendations that you have for uh, other young people to figure out how to be best informed? Yes, there are a lot of ways that you can make sure that you are an informed voter. You can go back and watch the presidential debates, the vice presidential debates that happened. There's also one that's going to be happening this Thursday. And there are plenty of websites that can help you understand where politicians stand on the issues. One of those websites is literally called On the Issues. It breaks it up into the different issues and tells you whether that person is, say, more left-leaning or right-leaning. Whatever you do, you don't want to go in this feeling like your vote has already been cast by other people or that you're being forced to do something, to write someone down, write someone in, that you don't really feel your heart is in. Because this is your vote. And you don't want to let someone else have two votes and you have zero. So you can watch the presidential debates and use different websites to understand where politicians stand on the issues. All right. Thank you so much, Jasmine. Uh, Deandra, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. And thank you, Jasmine. Thank you for the great work that you're doing. And thank you for that information that I think was not only beneficial for the youth, but it's, it's, it's beneficial for everyone who's voting. So thank you. Last but certainly not least, um, our next panelist, uh, like Elizabeth Swan and like Karen Ross, she was a part of the first Root Cause Racism blog series where we were sharing our visions and voices. Uh, Brunessa and I, our connection goes all the way back to Western Kentucky University. Go Hilltoppers. And my earliest member, memories of Brunessa, uh, well, for one, let me, let me talk about professionally who she is. She's a community advocate and she's a political influencer. And that just did not happen as she became an adult she was born a community advocate and a political influencer. <laughs> My early memories of her on the Hill included organizing sit-ins, um, getting people registered to vote. Um, some of our closest friends 
are now are, are became registered voters as a result of coming in contact with Brunessa Drayton. So she is a dear friend. She's a community activist. She's also a member of the Divine Nine. And it is an honor and a joy to have you on the panel. And today, what uh, Brunessa is going to talk to us about is voter suppression. That's something that's certainly not a, a past concern. It is a current concern. So to you, Vanessa. Thank you, DeAndrea. Thank you, Mark and the Kai Nexus family. I must say that I have just listening to the ladies on this panel thus far, I'm truly inspired. You know, Jasmine bringing it with the youth, Shelly, Shelly just talking about the women's suffrage movement and 1913 is a dear year for me and um, some of the things that um, some members of the organization that I'm a part of participated in in that time. And Elizabeth and Tracy, the postcards. I I'm proud to say that I received postcards and it was very different to, um, I'd never had that before in an election and it was very inspiring to get postcards. And Karen, vote for kindness. What can I say? We need to do more of that. But um, I would like to talk about today voter suppression then and now. Voter suppression has been around as long as the United States has been in existence. In the early years, voter suppression manifested itself in things such as poll taxes, literacy tests, intimidation, and physical violence. Poll taxes were things that voters were, or fees that voters were asked to pay before they cast their ballot. Literacy tests. Voters were asked to recite the U.S. Constitution and then interpret a passage from that said Constitution. Voters were even asked how many bubbles are in a bar of soap before they could actually cast that vote. Mobs came by for and intimidated those that were standing in line upwards to physical violence and attacking them. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 outlawed many of these discriminatory practices and prohibited racial discrimination in voting. Unfortunately, in 2013, the Supreme Court in a decision um, known as the Shelby County versus Holder case gutted the enforcement provision of the act. They removed what's known as preclearance. The preclearance -cle pre was intended to ensure that areas such as in the South and other parts of the US with a history of discriminatory laws, voting laws did not pass new restrictions impacting voters of colors to cast their ballot. After the removal, many states passed laws making voting more difficult. For example, certain states required new voting ID laws. They made it a requirement that you had to show a particular form of ID at the poll. In Texas, where we have two folks here, um, a handgun license can be used by, but a state issue student ID cannot. You may be asking yourself, what's the big deal about that? Well, more than half of the students at the University of Texas identify as non-white. Yet while more than 80% of Gun, of people with gun licenses in Texas are white. In Georgia, a few years ago, the Secretary of State conducted a voter purge and he removed over a half a million people off the voting rolls. This is the same Secretary of State who at that time was also running for governor. Upon doing a deeper dive of many of those that were removed from the voting rolls, many of them were African-Americans and Latinos. Some people were move, removed from the role simply because their name was misspelled or hyphenated. Other acts of voting suppression that you may see, in many areas, polling places are, were closed. Primarily most of those areas in, were in communities of color. Early voting times were reduced from three weeks to one. Saturday voting was taken off the calendar. In many African-American communities, Sundays were designated as stroll to the polls or souls to the polls. And Sundays were designated as days as where churches could go and vote. In certain communities, those days were removed. Here in Georgia, earlier this year, 
new voting equipment was brought in. Add the technological advances of, those, of, the, of that equipment, older workers, a presidential election, and an enthusiastic voting um, population, and COVID-19, you have the recipe of the long lines that you saw on TV last week here in Georgia. As I watch those lines on TV, what I also watch, some people left those lines and thought, well, I have another two weeks, I'll just come back. I personally have a family friend who actually waited 10 hours, 10 hours to vote in 2020. I was floored. I was, I was really floored. Recently, I attended a board meeting um, in which it was said that voter suppression is a matter of interpretation. I completely disagree. Voter suppression is real. It may occur in all subtle ways, but it has a significant impact on our voting. I'll leave with this. Have a voting plan. Vote early. If you vote by absentee ballot, be sure to drop it off in your county's drop box. Check with your county website to make sure that they have identified legitimate drop box. And once you voted early, volunteer to be a poll worker. And if you go to the polls, if you see something and it just doesn't feel right, or you feel that you're intimidating, being intimidated or harassed, please contact Election Protection at 866-OUR-VOTE. Thank you, DeAndrea. Vanessa, thank you. And you know, thank you for that particular um, tip about how to um, report problems. Um, you, know, you shared a lot of um, great thoughts with us. You know, thinking you know specific here, the current election. Um, it, how do how do you see voters? Um, you know, this unfortunate voter suppression skewing the results of the election, or you know, in particular, um, you know, the the ability of minorities uh, to to go and cast their vote. Uh, I would say, just particularly here in Georgia in this election. Some people have reported to me they're concerned about going to the poll because of some of the dog whistles um, comments that have been made about others going to watch the polls to ensure that the you know the voting is safe and that the ballot is protected. So my concern with that is you know people um, personally I've had someone say to me that you know do you mind going to the poll with me that day because I'm a I've been a bit scared. So this was just one person who shared that. How many others feel that way, but they just don't, they haven't said anything, or they may truly be deterred from going to the poll because they're scared. So I think in certain communities that it, it, there is a possibility um, that um, some communities will be suppressed. But I'm also encouraged uh, looking at what happened here in Georgia last week and the momentum that we see. Um, it's very encouraging to see that some people, no matter what, acts of suppression are being, um, are occurring, they are not allowing that to stop them from voting. So um, thank you, Bernessa, and thank you to um, all the panelists for everything you've shared and all the powerful um, words here in this first hour. So before we get into the broader um, Q&A section here, um, and I encourage people to continue submitting questions, uh, please do so using the Q&A. Uh, function, not the chat. I um, just want to make a couple of quick announcements. So um, this is, of course, the first of two webinar panel discussions that we have scheduled this week. So we hope you will come back and join us on Thursday at one o'clock Eastern for a, a panel called When Brothers Meet at Gemba. So uh, Deandra will be um, here joining us again um, as a moderator. Um, I'll be um, actually also joining as a panelist, because I contributed a blog to um, Deandra's new um, website, rootcauseracism.com. So I was um, honored to be able to help kick off that series. And as you see pictured here, um, wide ranging um, group of panelists, Hugh Alley, Christopher Chapman, Eric Ho, Sam Morgan, and Jeff Welch. So um, you can register, register for that today at kinexus.com slash webinars. And a, a quick reminder to Kinex's customers in the audience, um, the next training team office hours is going to be held um, with Adam and Matt um, on October 29th, one o'clock Eastern. You can also register for that. 
Um, people have asked, and, and again, as a reminder, the recording of today's session, the full 90 minutes, will be available in our continuous improvement webinars on demand library. All of that content is free. The August webinar um, is uh, the panel discussion um, that, that Deandra um, helped organize uh, is available there. Um, you can find a link on the sidebar of kinexus.com slash webinars. Uh, we have our blog at blog.kinexus.com. And we have a, a podcast series. So the audio, the full audio of today's session will be available later today in our podcast feed, which you can get um, in all the usual places. So if you want to revisit this or share it with someone to listen to uh, in their car or when they're out for a jog, um, I think today's session really lends itself well, um, of course, to the podcast format. So those were those are the announcements. And we've had a lot of comments coming in here um, about the, the panelists um, here today um, being amazing and um, a lot of thanks and, and people are feeling um, encouraged and, and uplifted. So um, really, really want to um, thank all our panelists um, for that again. Um, so we've, we've got questions. Um, question uh, for, for Karen and for anybody else who wants to, um, to then uh, jump in. How do you suggest we deal with social media posts um, that we're concerned about that might be giving incorrect information to voters? I think that uh, that is an unbelievably important question when you think about most most people and often young people. I have two young people, <laughs> young younger people of my own, young adults, who get most of their information from social media. They're not necessarily watching mainstream news. They're not reading mainstream newspapers. If you find a post, whether it be on Twitter, whether it be on Facebook, whether it be on LinkedIn, wherever it is that you believe has incorrect information, threatening information, please report that post to the, uh, to the platform. It's our responsibility, not just to be passive readers of information, but the kindest thing to do is to actually report that post. And if you're with someone who you know is reading it, if you're a young person, your child brings it to you, not only explain the problem with the post and it's a great time to have an interaction with them about, you know, we have to be careful about what we read on social media because there are people who are actually actively asking, giving us disinformation show them that the right thing to do when this happens is to be able to report that. It's a good beginning first step of advocacy and activism for them as well, right? That's what I would suggest. Thank Others, you, Others, what do you think? Yes. Hi. Deandra? Oh, well, you know, one of the things that, that we practice in continuous improvement in our different work environments um, that I think applies to the world see something, say something. And I'd like to add on to that, do something. And, you know, most people feel like there is some big grand act that needs to be completed to make a difference. One small thing can make a difference. So even if seeing um, social media posts with poor or incorrect or factual information, reporting it, you see it, you know, you're saying something, you're raising your voice. Um, and if it's someone you have a relationship with, it could be the case. Some people share posts because they think the information is correct. And if you have the type of relationship where you can engage that person and make it a teachable moment, that's one way of showing respect to the person who posted it and then making sure that we have accurate information. That's a way we show respect for others so that people are able to make an informed decision. This may be a little... Um... Um, not as direct, but I, I think um, I've been having some conversations with my 17 year old. He's like, did you see this on Snapchat? And I'm like, oh, so, you know, I'm, I'm having a conversation with him about we're born into identities, you know, our race, our gender. And there are some some uh, identities we choose and political affiliation is one of those choices. And that is fine. If you choose one or the other, that is fine. But your news source is not a part of your identity, 
right? So don't trust everything you see. Don't trust everything you read. Um, you know, and I, I, you know, I see that there's just sort of this blind trust uh, for certain sources and, and it's just, you can't let your guard down by just trusting sources in general, right? You should always question any source. Um, and so doing the right thing is one thing, but also, you know, making sure that you don't identify with a certain uh, channel of news, I think is an important, important message that, um, um, that I don't think people share enough of. I just want to jump in quickly, even though my role here is moderator, I can't help but be reminded of something I've heard from a lot of Toyota people connecting this to um, continuous improvement, the questions of what do you know and how do you know that it's true? That's a, those are really helpful questions in a workplace and um, I think in, in times like this. That's nice. Any other thoughts around this topic? I don't have a thought around this topic, but before we move on, um, Brunessa shared um, a phone number. Um, oh yeah, that was. Yeah, you're on mute. Somehow you ended up on mute. It was because I was I was multitasking. Plus, you so know, I wanted to make sure people. Could... Can we put that phone number in the chat? I think it's eight six six. Our chat. vote. Okay, I'm gonna put that in the chat, 866 our vote. And um, our, our friend Bella posted um, a, a comment. If you're working the polls or even if you're out voting and you see somebody being turned away, the kind thing to do is to pass on the state's voter protection hotline uh, to them. You might wanna look it up and confirm it and store it in your phone before you go out to vote or work. So I think that's a great suggestion from Bella. And then Bella also asked um, a, a question um, directed uh, at, at Jasmine. Um, what do you hear as uh, reasons for young people not registering and not voting? I recently talked, Bella did, to a neighbor, a young man with a new baby, and he said he wasn't registered and had no plan to. Personally, for me, what I'm hearing is that people feel like it's not necessary or that their vote doesn't matter or being a college student, I'm too busy. And speaking about the first two, your vote obviously does matter. It is something that people hundreds of years before you wish they could have the opportunity to do. Whether it's Black people, your ancestors wishing that they had the opportunity opportunity that you have, whether it is women wishing that they had the opportunity that you have, this is not something I believe that you have the opportunity to brush off because people literally did die for you to have these rights. And with respect to being too busy because of school, voting is more important to me than being in class for that day but I've already voted. So if someone is going to be doing voting in person, what you miss on that one day can't be rewatched at another time. Yes. I would also add um, in speaking with my 17 year old and um, some of his friends and being exposed to that, that age group, um, you know, I hear it's hogwash. It's all hogwash anyway. The politicians are hogwash and the choices are not good. And well, why do you feel that way? Um, and their exposure to media, you know, the campaigns of both sides and, you know, showing and demonstrating the horribleness as much as possible of each side. And they see that and they, they want to opt out. They're just like, I don't want any part of that. Um, and sadly, that means they are choosing by not voting, they're voting. Yeah. And with respect to people feeling like they don't have any politicians that they're seeing that are doing what they want to be doing, what they would like to see a politician doing, that's great. Thank you for noticing that, in, that that's your opinion. Uh, why don't you decide to run for a public office? There's someone in my class that's running for public office in Louisiana. And though I can't vote in Louisiana, uh, we're all supporting him from 
afar. So that is something that it's really valuable for someone to recognize. If you're not seeing the change you want in the world, be that change. Can I chime in on, on My, this? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, please, Shelly. You know, it, it's interesting, a couple of things. Um, one, my son said today, uh, there was a commercial that talked about a candidate very positively and one that immediately followed that was very negatively. And he was like, so which one is true? Is this person a good person or is this person a bad person? So you're right in the ways the ads, especially the negativity that's in the ads right now can make, I mean, I mean, if my six-year-old is like, I don't even know what to think. My teenagers certainly feel the same way. But what I've also found as a, at least I hope an effective strategy is trying to find those issues that really connect with them and show how those decision makers, even aside from Washington, D.C., but local elections, you know, how that makes such a big difference, you know, especially with the younger people that may be starting or if they've just gotten out of a job where it was a minimum wage. Do you feel like you earned more for your work? Well, who makes those decisions on what the minimum wage actually is? You know, what are the candidates views on that? Let you know, let's talk about livable wage. What do you what is your feeling about climate change? You know, do you want to be be able to breathe the air when you're an, uh, an adult with children, you know, what, what are those candidates who believe we need to do something to address, you know, what's going on uh, on planet Earth right now. So there's so many issues. And I think there are ways to find those points of connection, mm -hmm. and even really helping them understand that while our national election, of course, is immensely important, you know, so are our local elections and what's happening right now. And that often will allow more tangible points uh, for them to really be able to see democracy in action. And when they see those smaller margins, it really emphasizes how every vote really does count. Okay. Um, another question is made for the group in general. So when we talk about um, votes counting, there are some states that are never considered swing states where one, one party typically wins by a large margin. And sometimes that makes people feel like their vote doesn't matter. Do you have any thoughts or advice for somebody who's in that situation where they feel like, well, their vote's not going to tip it one way or another? Mark, this is Vanessa. I think, um, especially in, in light with what's happening with Georgia right now, you know, we are, everyone's watching Georgia. A decade ago, we were known as what was called not a swing state. We were just a red state. Um, as we know, 10 years later, the demographics has changed. That's why it's the importance of doing the census. Um, and as Shelley said, you know, even if you're not in a swing state or a state that's not, not perceived to be a part of the, you know, an influencer in that electoral college number, politics is local. Mm. Those local races are key. You're talking mm -hmm. about school board members, city councilmen, mayors, those are the people that are making the decisions that impact your life on a day to day basis. So, you know, to me, that's even bigger than an electoral college swing state or, you know, who gets in the Oval Office. It's that school board member who's making decisions that impact, you know, the schools that your children are attending, the, the county, um, the chair or the commissioner who is going to be deciding who or what uh, business is gonna be zoned in your neighborhood, who can make the decision whether or not they're, they open a, a, a plant near your house that's emitting toxins. So those races um, are just if, as important, if not more so than what's going on on the national level. Thanks, Vanessa. Anybody else with a thought on that? The, the only thing that I have to add is, um, you know, Bernessa, thank you for, for, for adding to that. You know, today, um, one of the blogs that ran in the series was uh, penned by our classmate, Jeff Welch. And the title of his blog is Three Steps to Becoming an Informed and Savvy Voter. And that's one of the important points that he made. Yes, the, you know, the presidential election is important, but there are other elections, and especially, you know, on the local level, 
um, where, you know, decisions will be made on that ballot that will have an impact on our lives. And so um, it's important that, you know, we become informed and we make those decisions and then we make a plan and get out there and vote. And I'm going to put a, a link to Jeff's post, um, which uh, is part of the new uh, rootcauseracism.com uh, website. Jeff's post, um, I've linked um, to it there. Um, here's uh, another question. This is, I think, directed to the group in general, and I'm sure there's all sorts of different perspectives to draw on here. So the question says, as a middle-aged white woman living in a predominantly white area, how can I best help encourage and support Black, Indigenous, other people of color um, to go and vote? So I'll answer since that's my profile right now. <laughs> Actually, a little beyond middle age. I don't know a lot of 120 year olds. Um, so some of the links that uh, Mark put out there and Tracy and I were talking about, um, I think could be good uses of time. Uh, the group um, Common Ground that has been since 2018 doing Reclaim Our Vote, uh, they have efforts around calling voters to encourage uh, them to get out and vote. And they've had success. And you see a, a marked increase in voter engagement uh, for some of these. The other one uh, that Tracy just looked into and got her teenage son who can't vote, but can help at the polls and get paid for it uh, is great. And what was that one, Tracy? That's Power the Polls? Power yes. the Polls. Dot org. I think it was part of the, whole. And, in the chat window earlier. Yes. And Mark shared it in the, in the chat window. Um, so those are uh, things you can do. And then I think all the women on this panel have talked about, you know, as, assisting people uh, to the polls, but I think you're in my position where, you know, the biggest wait I've ever had was 20 minutes yesterday to vote early. Um, it's other States and other communities having the trouble. So I think there it's um, looking for ways to, call voters to uh, help encourage to get the vote out. I'd like to add to that also because I live in a predominantly white area, which over the last few years is changing a little bit. Before we even talk about voting and throughout that, our time in our neighborhood, get to know your neighbors, right? Actually get to know your neighbors. If you see people walking down the street, no matter who they are, say hello. Make sure that we haven't lost that neighborhood feeling because then when times like this come along, you can have a discussion with people you know, you can make sure that they feel comfortable because they're your neighbors. And I vote for kindness. The truth is everybody everywhere is actually your neighbor. But on a day-to-day -day basis, get to know the people in your community, all of the people in your community, because then you have the opportunity to open a discussion with each one of them. They'll be your friends. And, and also to, you know, to go back to what Brunessa was talking about earlier, um, you know, if there are things that we see that, that can be interpreted or perceived or are, you know, ways that people's votes are being suppressed, um, we need to speak up to that and, and we need to make sure that's addressed. I think sometime, and this is just Deandra speaking right now, uh, that there are assumptions that, um, you know, people may or may not vote. You don't, you don't know what fear or what obstacles or what challenges people may be facing. And so it's important, like Karen said, get to know your neighbors um, and not just those who are on your block, those are within your circle of influence. Those who are your social media friends, those who are your colleagues, um, because you never know what type of fear people are dealing with. I was um, sharing a story with one of my office mates earlier about the number of conversations I've had with people within my circles of influence that are nervous about going out to vote uh, because of, um, like Vanessa mentioned, some of the dog whistles that have been, have been um, mentioned that they're afraid that something will happen to them. And so, um, you know, just, just standing up wherever we can to make sure that people have the support that they need and the strength that they need to, to be able to exercise that right to vote. I went around my town 
And I actually put out vote for kindness signs in places where I saw other political signs. And I have a vote for kindness sign on my lawn. And I believe that people in my neighborhood also will know because I have this sign on my lawn that if they need help, that I'm a safe place to come to, too. I'm often outside. <laughs> I'm wandering in the neighborhood. People know me as the lady pushing the cat in the stroller, right? Vote for kindness. <laughs> if you need help, we're going to help you. I think I want to go to Gemba in Karen's neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, that would be a learning experience, I'm sure. Right. Um, so maybe uh, we have one last question before we kind of shift into uh, a section here where we talk about calls to action and specific calls to action um, from some of the panelists. So um, you mentioned neighbors and, you know, I, I think, you know, times are very polarized uh, right now. Do you have thoughts on being kind to a neighbor who has a sign in the yard that's different than the way you're voting? I'll chime in. Um, <laughs> look, look I'll, I'll tell you a funny story first. Um, so when I put my particular sign <laughs> in the yard a couple of weeks ago, uh, I knew I might be the only one on my street who felt the way that I did. So as I was pushing it firmly down in the ground, I heard someone beside me say, hello, and I thought, oh my gosh, am I, am I about to be told like the HOA says, no, you have to take this there or something like that. So, and then um, the neighbor just struck up this, just a genuine conversation. So in, in my mind, I was preparing, oh my gosh, I know this is going to go political because this is just really too coincidental. And then I keep getting these neighborhood emails and the events are not aligned, you know, with, with my political views. So, and we ended up really having a good conversation and, you know, and eventually it did get political. And one of the things we talked about in terms of the issues that are important to us, and, and I talked about the divisiveness that's going on, and especially um, with the attacks on race, uh, some of the uh, undoings uh, in terms of diversity with the new memo um, outline critical race theory and really not willing to acknowledge um, racism in America and the detrimental effects of that that are still lasting. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I shared, um, and, and this woman was older and she was talking about her grandson. And I said, well, you know, when your grandson comes, do you have to go and make sure that the neighbors know that he's here so the police won't be called? And she was kind of like, well, no, I said, that's something that I have to think about. You know, when I see my son as my son, you know, just as Sabrina Fulton saw Trayvon, just as Tamir Rice's mother. Um, so those are conversations that I think open the door to help and try to get people to think differently. So when we think about kindness, we also have to think about empathy because what I'm seeing right now is just this rise in I'm fine. I might not agree uh, with this person's politics, but my financial report is good. So I'm going to ignore everything else that's happening that's hurting other people because I'm okay. And at some point, we have to get back to a collective concern and care for one another, which is so essential to me when I think about vote for kindness, because it may mean, okay, I might get hit a little more here. But if collectively it improves the lives of so many more people, would that not be something that essentially will all benefit from? So instead of thinking in terms of Descartes, I think therefore I am, you know, to really get back to the African principles, I am because we are. And if we can somehow work to shift mindsets around voting for kindness is taking myself individually and what benefits me if again, it comes at the oppression of someone else. So finding ways to kind of open those doors, to have those conversations, to get people to think differently because so often they don't consider, 
you know, what happens to other people because it doesn't affect them. So dialogues like this are so important and necessary. And again, I'm, I'm so glad that we're having this today, you know, with this phenomenal panel because it is important, importantly, or incredibly important. Thank you, Shelley. Um, Deandra, let me pass the gavel back over to you um, to, to help uh, facilitate the calls to action. Sure. So um, we want to be cognizant of that we have five minutes remaining. Um, and um, but the calls to action, you know, one of the main calls to action, Karen, you want to talk about the vote for kindness? Sure. And mm -hmm. just very really quickly, I want to say I really felt emotional about this topic before we came on the webinar. I feel even more emotional. So first of all, I'm going to ask everybody, please get out and vote. That's the most important thing. It is the kindest thing that you can do to have your voice heard. Vote. Please visit www.loveandkindnessproject.org. Order a sign for your lawn so people know that you're voting for kindness and start that discussion. You can also download a poster, stick it in your window. Vote for kindness because we have a choice about the world that we create. Honor the people who went before us, who struggled for us so that we could have the right to vote. Mm -hmm. Vote for the future so that our children and their children will live in a world of kindness. We have a choice, we have a vote. Great. Thank you, Karen. And, you know, from our other panelists, there, you know, some, some great information that you shared. Mark, thank you for, for putting those links into the chat. Um, you know, I, I want to remind everyone of the phone number that Brunessa provided, 866-OUR-VOTE. Um, in the event that there is a concern about anything regarding voter suppression. And then um, the link that Elizabeth and Tracy provided about, you know, any questions you may have about understanding, you know, where to go vote or anything associated with putting your plan together, because that's, that's what this is all about. We want you to plan and vote for kindness. You know, we don't want to wait until the election day and we wake up like, Oh, I think I'll go vote today. I wonder where should I go vote? Am I registered to vote? No, no, no. We have two weeks to get our plan together. And so please use the links that we've shared. And then another key link is IWillVote.com. Okay. IWillVote.com and the phone number and all the other links we've shared. To our panelists, do you have any other key things that you think we should highlight and spotlight as, as we close out for a, a great call to action or have we covered it? All right. I see thumbs up. I see hearts, all that kind of good stuff. So Mark, I will turn it back over to you. All right. Well, um, thank you so much, Deandra, for um, you know, recruiting an amazing panel. Um, thank you um, to all of our um, panelists, um, Shelley Luper Wilson, Elizabeth Swan, Karen Ross, Jasmine E. McCoy, Tracy O'Rourke, and, and Brunessa Drayton. Um, for some of you, it's great to see you again. For some of you, it's been a real privilege to be able to meet you mm -hmm. um, through the planning and um, for the execution of um, today's panel. I really can't thank you enough. Um, this is all important to the Kinexus team, and I appreciate the support from um, the Kinexus leadership team and the Kinexus team in general. Um, to help um, share the technology platform here um, for Zoom webinars, but um, to help share it with our customers and our community. And uh, we look forward again um, to the webinar on Thursday when brothers meet at Gemba. Um, again, you can register for that at kinexus.com um, slash webinar. So that's really uh, what I had to add here at the end. Um, Deandra? I have one more thing. And Please. thank you, Mark Graben. Um, thank you, and you Mark Graben and Kinexus. Um, if you look up the word ally in the dictionary, we'd mm -hmm. probably find an eight by 10 glossy of Mark. So <laughs> thank you for all that you do to help to um, heighten awareness, to help educate, to help support um, the work that you're doing. You know, you're setting a wonderful example for so many other people to help make an impact in not only people getting out to vote and voting for kindness, but to make 
this world a better place in which we live. So thank you for the work you're doing. Okay. Thank you, Deandra. Even though I am tempted to, re- to edit that out of the recording at the end. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you're too kind. Good. So I, I, I appreciate it. So um, thank you everybody for attending or thank you um, to those who have watched or listened to the recording. Um, vote kindly, everybody. Thank you. Be well. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.